Hello, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and welcome to Interior Design, The New Freedom. Today we'll be talking to architect, designer, teacher, exhibition organizer, writer, lecturer, Robert A.M. Stern. What's the best kind of client to have for all that wonderful work that you do? Well, um, I don't know. First, I suppose I should say a client who has a, enough money to spend on the project. But since nobody ever has enough, we can go on past that point. I think that the best clients are the clients that have ideas uh, about what they want and are able to articulate them, that who uh, have a distance from their themselves and from their ideas so that they recognize that when they hire someone, an architect or an interior designer or whomever, that they are entering into a professional relationship. And I suppose it's good that the, the best clients are the ones who don't confuse their architects with their psychiatrists. There, there is another dimension to it, which is to try to understand what the owner, the client, uh, has what his aspirations for the project are. As a rule, if a client comes to an architect or a designer for something, he clearly uh, wants something more than just shelter of any kind. And he wants something that will express something about himself, something about the place he's building in or whatever. And it, that is the hard part, to understand what the client wants, to suggest to the client that there are certain um, responsibilities that he has in building something that he may not even be aware of. That's the professional part of the thing. Architecture is a, a, a cultural act. It, you don't just build things willy-nilly, it seems to me. You build them in an appropriate way. The architect and the client working together, which is the best way, can interpret the whole range of, of the situation and make something good. How often does that happen? And what happens when your statement differs from the statement that the client thinks or knows they would like to make? Usually I get fired. Um, <laughs> barring that, the client sometimes realizes that maybe I have something to contribute that they hadn't thought about. In fact, the best clients do. I mean, they realize that they came to an architect or whomever because they could get something that they hadn't imagined themselves. And in the case of a domestic architecture or an interiors, people often come with armloads of the latest clippings from magazines. They even come with clippings of my own work, which sometimes I recognize or acknowledge. And also you have to have ideas of your own as an architect uh, or a designer before the client comes to your office. You can't invent architecture or how to do it w w with the client sitting there at the table. You have to have some way of working. Well, you are an architect, not an interior designer, yet you do do many interiors. How do you see your role as differing from that of someone who is a designer or a decorator or a space planner when the job involves only interior work? Well, I don't know what space planning is. I think that's something at NASA. Uh, I have no idea what that is. Um, I love interior decoration. Um, interior decoration implies that an architect, I don't care if he's licensed with a capital A or he's just some, has made a room or a series of rooms which have a distinct character that comes out of the architecture. And then the room needs other things that are not part of the architecture. It needs furniture, and it needs decorations and pictures or something on the walls to complete the ensemble. And a decorator, in the old sense, can help uh, and bring things and, as uh, and assemble fabrics. The architect can act as the decorator. Stanford White was a great decorator. Uh, that doesn't mean he was better or worse than his contemporary, Elsie DeWolf. But, but they both they approached decoration on decorative terms. Interior design is another matter, because I think interior design got invented when architects stopped doing architecture of interiors, when they stopped making rooms that had a character, when they uh, said that a room was merely a box of white, uh, surrounded by white walls, preferably not even a box, but a, a sort of interlocking series of volumes that moved through, and people uh, then were forced to inhabit these rooms in some way or other, whether for work or for of uh, their private lives. And the architect said, oh no, you call up the Museum of Modern Art, you get a Miro tapestry, you get a Calder, you get a Barcelona chair, and so forth, and you have, that's it, that's life. Clearly it isn't enough. You've also been described as one of the, and accurately so, as one of the leading exponents of postmodernism. Before we go on, won't you take a moment and reply to this? Um, Postmodernism is an invention, uh, as a term, is an invention of the devil since each of us wants to not be categorized in a narrow way. But it does mean, or does refer to the situation in architecture now 
in which there is a reaction to the kind of abstract um, empty white interiors or um, um, uh, gridded uh, in a non-communicative self-referential exterior architecture of the 1950s and 60s. Um, there is a seeking to return to the larger tradition of architecture, not to revive it, because it's very hard, no one can ever revive anything, no one knows exactly what was in the minds of any individual before or in any epoch before, but to see that work of the past. What's the origin of the term? It's been around for a very long while, I assume almost 40 years. It's a, it's a term that exists in, in history, in the writing of history, in which Arnold Toynbee said that after the Second World War we were in a postmodern epoch because of um, the, the bomb and because of the devastation of the war and so forth and the things were different. Uh, there are different interpretations of the term in art, but it certainly applies, it's used in literature and it's used in the plastic arts of painting and sculpture, and now it is used in um, architecture and design. The one thing I, would, I would, make, would like to make clear is it is not against modernism, which is what we used to call modern architecture, modernism of the 20s to the 50s. It, we are in a period in which we are looking at the, the, that architecture with critical eyes. That is, we're sorting out things that have genuine value, as we always do with things in the recent past, as opposed to things we supported for ideological reasons. Um, but it is not throwing anything overboard as modernism did. Modernism tried to throw tradition overboard. So do you see everything as continuity? Yes, and there's a broad continuity of, of modern architecture in the broad sense is Renaissance and post-Renaissance architecture and it continues all the way through and all of these movements, post-modernism, modernism and so forth to make art in the genuine sense um, as opposed to making decor, one has to connect up with broad traditions, principles of composition and not wander willy-nilly among the various stylistic sub-tastes um, and make things with today Regency, tomorrow I'm in a French provincial mood or whatever. Do you see antiques as paraphernalia? Uh, depends how they're used. Do you ever um, use them? Yes, often. And often we use antiques uh, or semi-antiques, uh, things from the early modern period, the craftsman furniture, the rattan furniture of the mm -hmm. summer porch or whatever, to heighten the architectural um, ideas of the project, to, to, to to make manifest in a concrete way things that a building, which is basically inarticulate by comparison, cannot. Why don't we talk about some specific jobs? One that you have done, uh, and let's start first with a non-residential place. Though it is an interior that has many of the aspects of a house, I'm referring to the Jerome Green Hall at Columbia University School of Law. What were you trying to do there? Um, we were trying to make a room for the, uh, a, a school in the university. Um, the Law School of Columbia is in a building of the 1950s, which is utterly characterless. And it has as much sense of, uh, of an academic institution and something uh, of the pillars of the law as the Port Authority bus station. Then you are um, the old. Uh, the either one. Um, they acquired the use of um, the former women's faculty club at Columbia, um, which was a okay building of the mid-20s, um, uh, and which then had been um, used for a hundred other things and had no character. So the strategy was to reintroduce a kind of character that was both appropriate to the women's faculty club and to the idea of a law school student facility. And my concept, after some conversation with the faculty and the students, was that most law students really were just prepping for Wall Street and just to the moment when they could get together and join the university club or wherever. So we tried to make an environment that bespoke of that, yet done on a modest budget and in a simple way that may be a slightly ironic way, but the furniture was big and four square and, um, and it covered in vinyl, but evoking the shapes of club chairs in a, in, in a downtown club. Perhaps you might talk about some of the architectural detail that the knowing eye could distinguish as the work of your fine hand and your use of color and placement and what it is that you had in mind. Well, you know, and not, to, not to contradict you slightly, I would, would prefer it if people didn't go from, to, from my buildings to building, uh, works to work and say, oh, that's a Bob Stern thing. Oh, I can tell Bob Stern did it. 
In that case, um, then what I was saying isn't succeeding because what I would like you to do is smile when you learn that Bob Stern did it and say, oh yes, I can see the sensitive hand. Okay, that's fine. Are there any lessons from that space that can be applied to the design of homes? Um, I think that the great traditions of architecture uh, have a certain continuity and columns and shaped columns. Entesis is there in a column because it's more beautiful than a straight column. And a column without a capital and a base isn't a column at all, but a pipe that's supporting a roof and so forth. And I more and more have increased in my respect, um, and this is certainly not the way I was educated, um, for those architects who freed of the telephone and freed of um, memos and harrying airplane rides and so forth could sit in their offices and in their studios 100 or 500 years ago and spend all their time worrying about the shape of the column. Your idea of home, however, your own home, has actually been widely published and is quite well known. I'm talking about an early apartment that you had on Central Park West with curving platforms and then a later apartment with curving walls and diagonal walls and a dramatic change from the original floor plan of a 1920s building. It was, um, on the one hand, it was a definitely a modernist work. It had white walls stripped down to some extent, although I would, will say that there were many of the details of the original apartment, which was a nondescript apartment, big but boring, of the 20s, uh, that were retained. But the, the way the, the apartment was remodeled spatially was to cut, make odd cuts through the plan big curving walls, for example, to move people through the spaces in a way that the sort of, uh, uh, the architect originally had never intended you to move. Um, those cuts were made in the most um, dramatic way so that you sensed a real slice taken through a thick wall. There was no attempt to um, be subtle about it. Furniture was placed on the diagonal. Um, uh, pictures were hung at strange relationships, sometimes closer to the floor than normal, um, in, in the case of the one with the platforms. Uh, so that the idea was there to make a dialogue between past and present, but the dialogue was more of a confrontational one than a conversational one. Well, tell us how they look to you this many years later and what you would do otherwise to them now. Well, um, I would probably still think that the plan of the, say, the larger Central Park West Department was lousy because a lousy plan is just a lousy plan. But I would then try to reshape that those series of spaces with walls and the, de the pertinent details that were more sympathetic to the inherent character of the building to its um, uh, aspirations to being a kind of Georgian apartment. And I would make new moldings and I would put new chair rails in in the rooms I thought it was appropriate. Um, I would um, uh, work in, it in, that, in that way. Uh, I would try to be both innovative spatially but not eccentric, which was part of the 60s. Well, from what I understand, a great deal of work is repeat work, so to speak that uh, the happy and satisfied client returns for yet more work. I, I did an apartment in a, in a very unusual kind of building facing Fifth Avenue and, um, seven or eight years ago. It was reasonably well published and it was a very good example of a kind of clean, clear um, modernism of technique with a very um, elaborate staircase which kind of was almost a room on two floors moving connected. It was a duplex apartment. Uh, some other people um, wished to buy that apartment but were unable to, but found it's almost identical built one in the only other building in New York that would be possible and, and hired me to repeat the first presumed success. Were you uh, willing to do so? No. No, I didn't want to do that. And they're very good, intelligent clients because they didn't fire me. And they said, well, what, what do you want to do? And they put me through the correct hoops to ask me questions like you're asking me of why I didn't want to do that before and why if it was good enough and so forth. And I was able to uh, say that not only was I seven years older and that much wiser, um, but that also my beliefs had changed and grown as a result of experience. And I think that anybody who doesn't change that way and, and make things and do them better differently and so forth and experiment is a person who's operating in a rut. Should a space, should an apartment reflect the lifestyle of the occupant and what their presumed needs are, or should it really be in terms of certain abstract or real notions of the architect who must then bring 
the client along, that does smack of the missionary. It, I'm not a missionary in that sense at all, but I think that it, it's clear I couldn't be a professional. I take that, very, that term very seriously if I did not bring um, to bear certain ideas and principles about the composition of walls, rooms, windows, what have you, that are not just about immediate concerns, lifestyle or whatever. I think you can have a good time in a palace, you can have a good time in the subway of New York. Um, that really, architecture isn't that, doesn't improve your lives. I don't believe architecture improves people's lives. Well, there is a structure that you've given some legal reference to that you do think can improve our lives, at least uh, make them more pleasing. And it's a recent work that you've done in a bedroom in East Hampton that you refer to as the Temple of Love. <laughs> yes, but I didn't think it would improve the uh, situation. It was just going to honor an occasion, that's all. <laughs> well, I won't press I'm, that I'm, point. I'm not in either sex therapy or, um, or, or psychiatry. Except the Temple of Love uh, has become for you a uh, clue and a precursor to your exploration of classical themes. Will you describe for us, if what I'm saying is accurate, what the temp your intent was in the the so-called Temple of Love, and how that has progressed since that recent design. The Temple of Love is nothing more nor, nor less than a, a, a gentle renovation of a sort of ordinary bedroom in an ordinary uh, single-story house in East Hampton, which has slight classical aspirations, about 97 removes from the source. Um, and um, the, there was a wonderful view out to a garden, and there was a need to make is something as simple as a bed and a headboard, and, and um, there were these rather dreary rooms. This rather dreary room had no character. We put some molding in. We tied together certain um, doors and gave them certain axial relationships that they didn't really have, and we blocked out others that seemed to be in the way. But the long and the short of it was to make this headboard um, as though it were made of keystones, but to upholster the keystones, and then to use some columns and some and, um, um, and car have it carry a cornice across to uh, uh, give a kind of presence to this. Most furniture that's interesting, it seems to me, in, the, in that sense, the bed and the headboard were a piece of furniture, uh, were our, our, our miniaturizations of architecture. And you use a lot of historical and classic elements, such as you did in the Chicago Tribune. Um, this thing lurking here behind me? Well, maybe we should unlock floor? it, see if you can um, tell us something about the I, I, Chicago I must hold Tribune this competition. Like the Philip Johnson pose with AT&T, you see, uh, <laughs> cradled in my arm. But, but there was a, a false, a faux competition. That is, uh, there was a competition in 1922 in Chicago for the design of the world's most beautiful tall building, which was won by a firm called Howells and Hood from New York who built the building more much as they designed it in the Gothic style. And um, the competition, all the entries to the competition were published in a, in a very thick book. Um, and it was, it has become, it was a very much ballyhooed competition at the time. Uh, and it has become an important landmark in the evolution away from traditional architecture to modernism. Well, tell us about the past, the present, and the future in your design. Well, the past is the column, fairly faithfully shown in, in its um, Tuscan order, adapted Tuscan order. Uh, you have columns that keep piling up, and in fact, they're handled as pilasters, as in Michelangelo's uh, use of the orders, and in fact, the raking cornice on the top is Michelangelesque. Um, it is, um, the present is that it is a true office building. If you look around the back, you can see that it's just a square tower, which would be finished. This is only two sides of the model, but you could have your office and your desk and your telephone there. It's sheathed in mirror glass, or reflective glass, I should say, of the uh, kind that's uh, all out of the catalog and is uh, all over our cities. But the glass is used not merely to reflect nice buildings around it, but to help to establish a real character for the building itself. By changing colors um, at, at the corners and in other parts of the design, one begins to emulate in glass stone architecture and suggest some of the techniques that architecture traditionally has had to organize itself in space in a clear way. Are you advocating a return to uh, an earlier past here as well? I find it amusing that all the interior design magazines are filled by and large with stuff that um, architects stopped doing 20 years ago. There's more modernism architect, modernist interiors being done by interior designers than any architects ever did. There always seems to be this very funny 
So dialogue. you're saying there is a lag between the architect and the designer? Mm hmm And how do we do something about that, or can we, or should we? Everybody should listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> and and would, hire me, especially, of And course. what would you advocate? Uh, well, I would advocate um, taking all the stuff out of the attic that you threw up there, um, getting off the floor, sitting on chairs. That's not uh, what you told us 20 years ago, Bob. Well, I never told you to sit on the floor on cushions. No, no, once. I only did that once, and I, <laughs> my back broke once, and I never did that one again. Okay, so here we are re-emptying the attics. Re-emptying the attics of your minds and the attics of your houses. Um, the attics of your houses I don't much care about, but I am concerned about your mind. And one of the ways that you are using traditional forms is in the design of furniture for some of the projects that you are currently involved in that also rely on classical columns. Can you tell us something about that? Well, if we compared, for example, this table, which is accurately called a drum, um, <laughs> because a drum is one of the least interesting forms in, in, in solid geometry, and certainly in musical instruments, nobody's ever collected, very few people collect drums, particularly <laughs> undecorated drums, for, for, for their beauty. Um, I, I would say that in the history of architecture, other shapes have been used more interestingly. One of which, as I tried to make the point before, is that architectural elements in compressed or reduced form are very beautiful. I have been experimenting with the use of the column as my interpretation of it related to this building and other projects for furniture, some of which I think will go into production in a year or so. What are I, you doing? Well, I can't tell you. I can only... This is, these are what are called trade secrets. Well, can Architects you give us a preview in, in terms of... A series of, of tables and... Um, things that tables can become, like sideboards and other elements, um, based on the column, the classical column theme, and an interpretation of it. And the hope is to find new materials and techniques to give them not only an, a new shape or an interpretive shape, but also make you see them in a very fresh and new way, the traditional form expressed in a new way. Much of your work involves houses, of course, architecture, not just interiors, and you're especially well known for your houses that derive from the work of the shingle style. To begin with, can you tell us what that means and how literal you are in your reuse of history? Well, to begin with, the shingle style is that architecture we associate with Eastern um, summer resorts in particular the work of H.H. H. Richardson, the early work of McKim, Mead, and White before they started to do grand Newport palaces, the older parts of uh, resort communities in Newport and elsewhere. It is an interesting style because it is the, in, an illustration a hundred years ago of a similar attitude that I believe in now. That is, it combined clear planning techniques that were basically classical with a compositional technique that relied on the early salt box cottages, basically shingled roofs coming down low to the ground, eccentrically placed windows, pronounced chimneys, and so forth. It also was made possible by the new technology of the mid-19th century, which allowed rooms to be opened up because central heating had been introduced and all kinds of convenience devices in the kitchens, um, and the railroad made the summer communities possible as well. It was possible to manage two houses in a, in a family, a middle-class family. Um, I admire those houses. They continue to define for me seaside life at its best. How do you make a room? Where do you start? What's the most important thing in an interior? I would like to be able to get into the middle of the room and be able to look all different ways and sense a kind of orga an orderly organization of the parts. I like rooms that have a, a decided floor quality. I, I don't like wall-to-wall -wall carpeting particularly because it doesn't have that quality. I think a pattern on the floor something and the wood, something that reinforces the room's geometry helps you to understand it. <coughs> Similarly, the ceiling. If I had my choice, I wouldn't have flat ceilings. Who would, I suppose? But I guess some people would. I actually have been to enough places where people get rid of all that cove stuff and hang a ceiling. It seems wrong to me. I like the volume of the ceiling to reinforce the centrality of the room. Why be in the center of the room, you might ask? Because I still believe that man is the center of all things on this earth, and one thing you want to do is get in the middle and be able to feel that your place, that you're more important than the room, that you're the ordering device to the room. What do you think of the state of American crafts? I've often felt that the technology was excellent, but the aesthetics, as you point out, are lacking, let alone okay. the functional. Okay. 
Hokey? Because it's lost Are you from saying hokey, hokey or hokey. funky? Hokey. Or both. Hokey is funky. It's the yes. same thing. Sure, because, I mean, it's lost all, conduct, all relationship to high art because high art dismissed craft as just craft. I mean, Venuto Cellini was a craftsman, but he wasn't shown at the Museum of Contemporary Crafts back in Florence in the old days. He was operating at his, in his way as part of a tradition of art, altogether one stream. Does your office involve the work of craftspersons? It must, in order to achieve the results that you have in mind. Well, we've been fortunate in finding people who do things for us. We've amazingly found people who are thrilled to do things for us. Some people we get from the decorating profession, I have to admit. We now know where to get people who can make the most beautiful marble out of plywood imaginable through the magic of paint. What have they been and, doing for the last 30 years? Um, well, they've either been working for decorators or they haven't been asked. In one case, um, uh, they've worked for sets. They've done theater and things like that. Um, but in one case, we did a fireplace uh, in stone in Maine and we imagined that we would have to draw it and make working drawings and all that stuff to do it. And the reality of it was we went and met the craftsman and we showed him a rough sketch of what we wanted and we said, we'll send you a drawing. He said, don't send me a drawing. I know what you want and I'll do it. Did and he? from that sketch he made an absolutely beautiful fireplace because he understood his material. We then asked him why, how often did he do these things? And he said he hadn't, hadn't done one in years. And we said, why? He said, nobody asked. Um, everybody wants their stone walls, I guess, to look like pizza huts. I don't know. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened to the idea of architect as reformer or revolutionary? I hope it went with the dodo bird. I mean, I, I, it's a terrible idea. I, in my personal life, I may be the most zealous re reactionary or the most zealous revolutionary, but my job as an architect is to take a situation and to translate it into a three-dimensional thing we call a building, which can be not only used, I wouldn't be very responsible, but will also, in its design, represent that situation in relationship to the tradition of that situation. I think things are changing, though. I mean, the buildings around New York, though they're m largely pretty dull still, are much less dull than they were. Well, I think you've shown us that it's now old-fashioned to be modern and modern to be old-fashioned, but whatever you've done, you've uh, given us a very lively interesting and provocative evening as you always do robert stern thank you very very much for being with us thank you, thank you.